Thor was the first operational ballistic missile deployed by the U.S. Air Force USAF. Named after the Norse god of thunder, it was deployed in the United Kingdom between 1959 and September 1963 as an intermediate-range ballistic missile IRBM, with thermonuclear warheads. Thor was 65 feet 20 meters in height and 8 feet 2.4 meters in diameter. It was later augmented in the U.S. IRBM arsenal by the Jupiter. A large family of space launch vehicles—the Thor and Delta rockets—were derived from the Thor design. Topic. Design and development Fearful that the Soviet Union would deploy a long-range ballistic missile before the U.S., in January 1956 the USAF began developing the Thor, a 1,500 miles intermediate-range ballistic missile. The program proceeded quickly, and within three years of inception the first of 20 Royal Air Force Thor squadrons became operational in the UK. The UK deployment carried the codename, Project Emily. One of the advantages of the design was that, unlike the Jupiter MRBM, the Thor could be carried by the USAF's cargo aircraft of the time, which made its deployment more rapid. The launch facilities were not transportable, and had to be built on site. The Thor was a stop-gap measure, and once the first generation of ICBMs based in the U.S. became operational, Thor missiles were quickly retired. The last of the missiles was withdrawn from operational alert in 1963. A small number of Thors, converted to thrust augmented delta, Launchers, remained operational in the anti-satellite missile role as Program 437 until April 1975. These missiles were based on Johnston Island in the Pacific Ocean and had the ability to destroy satellites in low Earth orbit. With prior warning of an impending launch, they could destroy a Soviet spy satellite soon after orbital insertion. These missiles remain in storage, and could be reactivated, although the W-49 Mod 6 warheads were all dismantled by June 1976. Topic. Initial development Development of the Thor was initiated by the USAF in 1954. The goal was a missile system that could deliver a nuclear warhead over a distance of 1,150 to 2,300 miles 1,850 to 3,700 kilometers with a SEP of 2 miles 3.2 kilometers. This range would allow Moscow to be hit from a launch site in the UK. The initial design studies were headed by CMDR. Robert Truax, U.S. Navy, and Dr. Adolf K. Thiel, Ramo Wooldridge Corporation, formerly of Redstone Arsenal. They refined the specifications to an IRBM with a 1,750 miles 2,820 kilometers range 8 feet 2.4 meters diameter 65 feet 20 meters long so it could be carried by Douglas C-124 Globemaster a gross takeoff weight of 110,000 pounds 50,000 kilograms 
propulsion provided by half of the Navajo-derived Atlas booster engine due, largely, to the lack of any alternatives at this early date. 10,000 miles per hour, 4.5 kilometers per second maximum speed during warhead re-entry. Inertial guidance system with radio backup for low susceptibility to enemy disruption like Atlas. Thor utilized vernier engines for roll control. They flanked the main engine instead of being on the sides of the missile. On 30 November 1955, three companies were given one week to bid on the project, Douglas, Lockheed, and North American Aviation. They were asked to create a management team that could pull together existing technology, skills, abilities, and techniques in an unprecedented time. On 27 December 1955 Douglas was awarded the prime contract for the airframe and integration. The Rocketdyne Division of North American Aviation was awarded the engine contract, AC Spark Plug the primary inertial guidance system, Bell Labs the backup radio guidance system, and General Electric the nose cone, re-entry vehicle. Douglas further refined the design by choosing bolted tank bulkheads as opposed to the initially suggested welded ones and a tapered fuel tank for improved aerodynamics. The engine was developed as a direct descendant of the Atlas MA3 booster engine. Changes involved removal of one thrust chamber and a rerouting of the plumbing to allow the engine to fit within the smaller Thor thrust section. Engine tests were being performed as of March 1956. The first engineering model engine was available in June, followed by the first flight engine in September. Engine development was complicated by serious turbopump problems. Early Thor engines suffered from bearing walking, a phenomenon that occurred at high altitude as the air thinned, causing the lubricant oil in the pump to foam and push the bearings out of their sockets. When this happened, the turbopump would shut down, terminating engine thrust. The initial Thor tests in 1957 used an early version of the Rocketdyne LR-79 engine with a conical thrust chamber and 135,000 pounds of thrust. By early 1958, this had been replaced by an improved model with a bell-shaped thrust chamber and 150,000 pounds of thrust. The fully developed Thor IRBM had 162,000 pounds of thrust. Topic: First launches. Thor test launches were to be from LC-17 at Cape Canaveral Missile Annex. The development schedule was so compressed that plans for the Atlas bunker were used to allow the completion of the facility in time. Nevertheless, Pad LC-17B was just ready for the first test flight. The first flight ready Thor, Missile 101, arrived at Cape Canaveral in October 1956. It was erected on LC-17B and underwent several practice propellant loading, unloading exercises, a static firing test, and a month-long delay while a defective relay was replaced. Launch finally took place on 25 January 1957. The Thor failed almost immediately at liftoff as the engine lost thrust, dropped back onto the pad, and exploded. 
Engineers could not determine the cause until viewing film of pre-launch preparations that showed crews dragging a LOX filler hose through a sandy area. It was concluded that debris had entered the LOX and contaminated it, causing valve failure. Thor 102 was launched on 20 April. The booster was performing normally, but an erroneous console readout caused the range safety officer to believe that it was headed inland and he initiated the destruct sequence 35 seconds into the launch. It was then found that a tracking console was wired in reverse, causing the Thor's trajectory to be shown as the opposite of where the missile was headed. The short flight raised confidence that it would fly. The third Thor launch, missile 103, did not get off the pad and exploded 4 minutes before the planned launch. A defective valve allowed LOX tank pressure to build up to unsafe levels. The accident was also the fault of technicians failing to pay attention to pressure gauges. LC-17B consequently had to be repaired for the second time in four months. Missile 104, launched the 22nd of August from the newly opened LC-17A, broke up at T plus 92 seconds due to a drop in signal strength from the programmer, causing the engine to gimbal hard right. The guidance system tried to compensate, but ended up producing uncontrolled yaw maneuvers that caused excessive structural loads. Thor 105, the 20th of September, 21 months after the start of construction, flew 1,100 miles, 1,800 kilometers downrange. No telemetry equipment was included on this missile and the weight savings allowed it to achieve a total range of 1,500 miles, 2,400 kilometers. Missile 107, the 3rd of October, fell back onto LC-17A and exploded at launch due to the gas generator valve failing to open. Missile 108, the 11th of October, exploded around T plus 140 seconds without prior warning. Engineers were bewildered as to the cause of the failure. After the first Thor Able launch failed six months later due to a seized turbopump, it was concluded to be the cause of 108's demise, although the missile did not have sufficient instrumentation to determine the exact nature of the failure. The final three Thor tests during 1957 were all successful. 1958 began with back to back failures. Thor 114 was destroyed by range safety 150 seconds into launch when the guidance system lost power and Thor 120's engine shut down slightly under two minutes after liftoff. The telemetry system had experienced a power failure during launch, so the reason for the engine cutoff could not be satisfactorily determined. On 19 April, Missile 121 dropped back onto LC-17B and exploded, putting the pad out of action for three months. A fuel duct collapse was believed to have been the culprit. On the 22nd of April, Missile 117, carrying the first able upper stage, lost thrust and broke up at T plus 146 seconds due to a turbopump failure. The Jupiter, Thor, and Atlas missiles all used a variant of the Rocketdyne LR-79 engine and all three suffered launch failures due to a marginal turbopump design. There were two separate problems with the pumps. The first was the discovery during testing at Huntsville that the lubricant oil tended to foam at high altitude as the air pressure decreased. 
The other was that pump shaft vibration from the nearly 10,000 rpm operating speed would cause the bearings to come out of their sockets, resulting in the pump abruptly seizing up. The Army had suspended Jupiter launches for four months until the turbopump issues could be resolved, and as a result no more pump failures affected that program. General Schriever rejected the idea of sending Thor and Atlas missiles back to the factory and decided that he would only allow in-field modifications so as to not delay the testing program. He agreed to install the fixes for the lubricant issue, which included pressurizing the turbopump gearboxes and using an oil with a different viscosity that was less prone to foaming, but not the modified bearing retainers. Six consecutive Thor and Atlas launches failed during February to April 1958, although not all of them could be attributed to turbopump problems. Then there were no turbopump failures for the next four months, leaving the Air Force with a sense of overconfidence that was rudely ended when Thor Able 127, carrying the world's first lunar probe, exploded during launch on 17 August due to a turbopump failure. A month later, Atlas 6B also suffered a turbopump failure, and after this, the Air Force gave in and agreed to replace the turbopumps in all of their missiles, after which there were no more launch failures due to a turbopump problem. The necessary modifications to the missiles would have taken only one month and not caused any delay to either Thor Able 1 or Atlas 6B's flights, thus those failures were ultimately attributed to poor management of the programs. Five successful Thor tests were conducted in June to July 1958, the last one carrying a mouse named Wiki on a biological mission. The capsule sank into the ocean and could not be recovered. Thor 126, the 26th of July, lost thrust 50 seconds into launch when a LOX valve inadvertently closed. The vehicle pitched down and broke up from aerodynamic loads. Then on 30 July, a tragic accident occurred at the Thor static test stand in Sacramento, California when a LOX valve failed, causing a fire that severely burned six Douglas technicians, three of whom later succumbed to their injuries. Phase 2 testing with the AC Spark Plug Inertial Guidance System began 7 December with the first successful flight on 19 December 1957. The operational variant of the Thor, the DM-18A, began testing in the autumn of 1958, but Missile 138, the 5th of November, went out of control shortly after liftoff and had to be destroyed. Nonetheless, Thor was declared operational and testing now began at Vandenberg Air Force Base on the west coast when Missile 151 flew successfully on 16 December. On 30 December, a near-repeat performance of the 5 November failure happened when Missile 149 lost control and was destroyed 40 seconds into launch. After a run of successful launches during the first half of 1959, Missile 191, the first to be launched by a Royal Air Force crew, suffered another control malfunction while being launched from VAFB. This time, the missile's pitch and roll program failed to activate and it continued flying straight up. Launch crews initially did nothing as they reasoned that the Earth's rotation would gradually take it away from land and they wished to continue collecting data as long as possible. Eventually though, they became nervous about it exploding or pitching over, so the destruct command was sent around 50 seconds into launch. 
High altitude wind caused debris to land in the town of Orkut near the base. After Thor 203 repeated the same failure four weeks later, an investigation found that the culprit was a safety wire that had been meant to prevent the control tape in the programmer from inadvertently coming loose during vehicle assembly. The wire would ordinarily be cut after installation of the programmer in the missile, but Douglas technicians had forgotten this important step, thus the tape could not be spooled and the pitch and roll sequence did not activate. Another 23 Thor missile tests were carried out during 1959, with only one failure, when missile 185 on 16 December, the second RAF launch, broke up due to a control malfunction. Topic. Service rivalry with Jupiter The Jupiter missile, a joint effort of Chrysler and the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, had originally been developed for submarine launching, but would have involved the extremely risky situation of a liquid-fueled rocket stored in the confines of a submarine. By 1956, the Polaris program was proposed instead, which featured a solid-fueled SLBM that was much lighter and safer to store. The Navy quickly switched to Polaris and dropped Jupiter, which was then transferred to the Army as a terrestrial missile. With two IRBMs of nearly identical capabilities, the Army and Air Force were at loggerheads with each other as it seemed obvious that only one of the two would ultimately achieve operational status. Jupiter's testing program, which began two months after Thor's, proceeded more smoothly and avoided accidents such as the explosion of Thor 103 due in large part to the employment of the experienced rocket team of Werner von Braun. The turbopump issues that plagued early Rocketdyne engines were also resolved in Jupiter much earlier than the Air Force's missiles. The Jupiter program was more successful also due to far better testing and preparation, for example, each missile was given a full duration static firing in Huntsville prior to delivery. A static firing stand for Thor tests was only opened in May 1958, at which point the missile's launch record stood at four successes and nine failures, including four pad explosions. For comparison, there had been only three Jupiter failures as May 1958 ended, only eight launches had taken place against Thor's 13, with no pad explosions. Thors were given a PFRF pre-flight readiness firing prior to launch. These were between 5 to 15 seconds only as the launching facilities were not designed for a full duration firing as a static test stand was. Missile 107 had not been given a PFRF at all and its launch ended in a pad explosion. Thanks to the thorough testing done at Huntsville, Jupiter missiles mostly all arrived at CCAS in flight-ready condition while Thor's typically required extensive repairs or modification before launch. The panic that struck the U.S. after the Soviet launches of Sputnik 1-2 in late 1957 caused Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson, in his final act before leaving office, to announce instead that both Thor and Jupiter would go into service. This was both out of fear of Soviet capabilities and also to avoid political repercussions from the workplace layoffs that would result at either Douglas or Chrysler if one of the two missiles were cancelled. Deployment 
Deployment of the IRBM fleet to Europe proved more difficult than expected, as no NATO members other than Great Britain accepted the offer to have Thor missiles stationed on their soil. Italy and Turkey both agreed to accept Jupiter missiles. Thor was deployed to the UK starting in August 1958, operated by 20 squadrons of RAF Bomber Command under US-UK dual key control. The first active unit was No. 77 Squadron RAF at RAF Feltwell in 1958, with the remaining units becoming active in 1959. All were deactivated by September 1963. All 60 of the Thor missiles deployed in the UK were based at above-ground launch sites. The missiles were stored horizontally on transporter erector trailers and covered by a retractable missile shelter. To fire the weapon, the crew used an electric motor to roll back the missile shelter, essentially a long shed mounted on steel rails, then used a powerful hydraulic launcher erector to lift the missile to an upright position for launch. Once it was standing on the launch mount, the missile was fueled and could be fired. The entire launch sequence, from starting to roll back the missile shelter through to ignition of the rocket engine and lift off, took approximately 15 minutes. Main engine burn time was almost 2.5 minutes, boosting the missile to a speed of 14,400 feet per second, 4,400 meters per second. Ten minutes into its flight the missile reached an altitude of 280 miles 450 kilometers, close to the apogee of its elliptical flight path. At that point the re-entry vehicle separated from the missile fuselage and began its descent toward the target. Total flight time from launch to target impact was approximately 18 minutes. The Thor was initially deployed with a very blunt conical GE MK2 heat sink re-entry vehicle. They were later converted to the slender GE MK3 ablative RV. Both RVs contained a W49 thermonuclear warhead with an explosive yield of 1.44 megatons. The IRBM program was quickly eclipsed by the Air Force's ICBM program and made redundant. By 1959, with Atlas well on its way to operational status, Thor and Jupiter became obsolete, although both remained in service as missiles until 1963. In retrospect, the IRBM program was a poorly conceived idea as it depended on the cooperation of NATO allies, most of whom were not willing to have nuclear missiles on their soil, and was also surpassed by the ICBM program, yet continued anyway for political reasons and a desire to keep the workforce at their respective assembly plants employed. Thor's lasting legacy was not as a missile, but its use as the basis for the Thor – Delta space launcher family into the 21st century. Topic. Noteworthy flights The 2nd of June 1962, failed Bluegill flight, tracking lost after launch, Thor and nuclear device destroyed. The 19th of June 1962, failed Starfish flight, Thor and nuclear device destroyed 59 seconds after launch at 30 to 35,000 feet, 9.1 to 10,668.0 meters altitude. The 8th of July 1962. 
Thor missile 195 launched a Mk-4 re-entry vehicle containing a W-49 thermonuclear warhead to an altitude of 250 miles 400 kilometers. The warhead detonated with a yield of 1.45 mt of TNT 6.07 petajoules. This was the Starfish Prime event of nuclear test series Operation Fishbowl. The 25th of July 1962, failed Bluegill Prime flight, Thor and nuclear device destroyed on launch pad, which was contaminated with plutonium. Topic: <laughs> Launch vehicle Despite being retired from deployment as a missile a few years after deployment, the Thor rocket found widespread use as a space launch vehicle. It was the first in a large family of space launch vehicles. The Delta rockets. The last remaining descendant of the Thor, the Delta II, was retired in 2018, and the Delta IV is based on entirely new technology, unlike the Delta II. Topic. Operators Topic. Former operators United States United States Air Force Off South Ruislip 705th Strategic Missile Wing 1958-1960 United Kingdom Royal Air Force Off Bomber Command C Project Emily Stations and Squadrons Topic Specifications PGM one seven A Family Thor IRBM Thor minus eighteen German marks single stage fifty five Thor minus nineteen German marks rocket first stage Thor minus twenty one German marks rocket first stage Thor DSV 2D E F G suborbital LV Thor DSV 2J anti ballistic missile Thor DSV 2U orbital launch vehicle Overall length 19.82 meters 65.0 feet Span 2.74 meters 9.0 feet Weight: forty-nine thousand eight hundred kilograms, one hundred nine thousand eight hundred pounds. Empty weight: three thousand one hundred twenty-five kilograms, six thousand eight hundred eighty-nine pounds. Thrust: vac: seven hundred sixty kilonewtons. Liftoff thrust SL 670 kilonewtons 150000 lbf ISP 282s 2.77 kilonewtons s per kilogram ISP SL 248s 2.43 kilonewtons s per kilogram Burn time, 165 s Core diameter, 2.44 meters Maximum range, 2,400 kilometers 1,500 miles Ceiling, 480 kilometers 300 miles Warhead when W-49 warhead on MK Two re-entry vehicle Warhead mass, 1,000 kg, 2,200 pounds Yield, equivalent to 1.44 megatons of TNT 6.02 petajoules 
SEP, 1 km, 0.62 miles. Boost propulsion, liquid fueled rocket, LOX and kerosene. Engines Rocket Dyne LR 79NA9, model S3D, 666 kilonewtons, 150,000 lbf. Vernier 2X Rocket Dyne LR 101NA, 4.5 kilonewtons, 1,000 lbf each. Propellants, LOX, kerosene, Thor kerosene propellant was referred to as RP-1 by RAF users. Thrust, VAC, 760 kN. ISP, 282 S, 2.77 kN S per kilogram. ISP, sea level. 248 s 2.43 kN s per kilogram burn time 165 s mass engine 643 kg diameter 2.44 meters chambers 1 chamber pressure 4.1 megapascals Area ratio, 8.00 Thrust to weight ratio, 120.32 Country, USA First flight, 1958 Last flight, 1980 Flown, 145 Comments, designed for booster applications. Gas generator, pump fed. Guidance, inertial. Maximum speed, 17,740 km per hour, 11,020 miles per hour. Development cost US dollars, $500 million. Recurring price US dollars 6.25 million dollars Total number built 224 Total development built 64 Total production built 160 Flyaway unit cost 750,000 United States dollars in $1,958. Launches 59, failures 14, success rate 76, 27 percent. First launch date, the 25th of January 1957. Last launch date, the 5th of November 1975. Topic. See also. Project Emily Strategic Air Command. Thor rocket family. Thor Abel Thor Agena Thor Delta Related lists List of military aircraft of the United States List of missiles <laughs>